Well, good morning and happy 4th of July. My name is Jeff Kramer and I'm the pastor of Crestview Austin Baptist Church. We're so glad that you chose to worship with us today. Yesterday, our nation celebrated our freedom from the slavery and oppression from the British rule. Now, July 4th is the anniversary of the adoption of the Declaration of Independence by the Continental Congress that took place in 1776. Now, in Texas, we recently celebrated Juneteenth. Uh, this is a holiday celebrating the emancipation of those who were enslaved in the United States. Uh, Juneteenth actually started in Texas. Now it remembers uh, Union Army General Gordon Granger announcing federal orders in Galveston, Texas on June 19th, 1865, proclaiming that all the slaves were free. Now almost two and a half years earlier, President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation had officially outlawed slavery in Texas and other states that had rebelled against the Union. So from September 22nd, 1862 to June 19th, 1865, the slaves were legally free. But experientially, they were still slaves due to, number one, the ignorance of what was now true of them as Americans. And also, experientially, they were still slaves because slavery was still being enforced by the culture in which they lived. You see, it took the proclamation of President Abraham Lincoln and the enforcement of the law by General Granger to enable slaves to realize and to live their lives as free men and women. So the Emancipation of Proclamation and Juneteenth is an excellent example of what happens to us on a spiritual level when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and allow him to pay the penalty of our sins. Now in the same way that the slaves were legally freed from the bondage of slavery and did not know it, are the people free from the bondage of sin and do not know it. A little over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the grave to pay the penalty of our sins. Now, if we place our faith in Christ and believe in him, our sins are forgiven and we can know that when we die that we will go to heaven. You see, not only does our salvation give us eternal life, but Jesus frees us from the power of sin on this side of eternity. You see, Jesus has broken the power of the chains of the slavery of sin that controls our lives. The truth is that we are free if we've accepted Christ in our life and what he's done. We are free, but the sad truth is that either we do not know the truth, we do not know this is a fact, or we've never really reckoned or realized this to be true about our lives, that we have been freed from the power and the slavery of sin. So today I'm here to tell you, you are free. Now Jesus paid the debt for your sin, so you need to accept it. If you've already accepted Christ, receive what is already yours, freedom in Christ. So today, we're briefly going to look at four areas where Jesus has given us freedom and how it should change our lives. 
So in the same way as the proclamation was true, but yet they were yet to realize it and to be set free, even though it's true, the same way with many people who've already accepted Christ, you've accepted Christ and you're free from the power of sin, but yet you're still living under the power of sin because you do not know how and you do not understand the consequences of what Christ has done for you and the Holy Spirit in your life and how he can break that power of sin that is in your life. So first of all, that leads us to very clearly, the first truth here is that Jesus frees us from sin. Jesus frees us from sin. Look at Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 19. Verse 16, Jesus said, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now this is incredible. I want you to think about this. Jesus started his public ministry and as he read from the book of Isaiah when Isaiah was prophesying hundreds of years in the past of what God was going to do and so Jesus as he reads this passage in Isaiah very clearly he is the fulfillment of this passage and so Jesus ministry is very clearly represented here in the book of Isaiah, which he reads here, in saying he has come to proclaim the release to the captives and to set free those who are downtrodden. So Jesus' ministry is to free people from the bondage of sin. You see, today, the question is, well, how does Jesus set us free from sin? How, how, does he, how does he set me free that I, that I don't have to sin anymore? Well, very clearly, so how does Jesus set us free from sin? Well, first of all, we need to understand that the truth shall set you free. And of course, if you've been around the University of Texas and Austin and looked up at the, the, uh, the bell tower or the, the, there, you will very obviously see a uh, uh, the university that they have this this verse the truth shall set you free but I wonder if people go back and understand that the history of this because this is exactly what Jesus is saying in John chapter 8 verses 31 through 32 so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him if you continue in my word then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. In other words, they will be set free from trying to live a legalistic type of life to please God. And we'll talk more about that in a second. They are free to enjoy a relationship with God. So the truth here is very obviously. So what is the truth? The truth is this. The truth is all people have sinned. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, we have turned our backs on God and we have turned away from God. Uh, sin, in other words, sometimes we shake our fist at God and say, God, I want nothing to do with you. Or we just turn our backs and, and, and we ignore God. This is what the Bible calls sin. We've missed the mark of perfection. So all of us has sinned, black and white, and there's no question, no gray area. Every person has turned their back on God. Number two, the second truth is this. The truth is there's a price to pay for your sin. The price of turning our back on God is eternal separation from him. It is spending eternity separated from God in a devil's hell. And that is the punishment. That is the cost of going our own way. The truth is, the good news is that Jesus Christ paid the price for your sin, my sin, on the cross. He paid the penalty for us messing up on the cross. So our rebellion, and he paid the penalty on the cross for every person. 
And so, the, again, the truth is we've all sinned. There's a price to pay for sin. The good news is that Jesus Christ paid the penalty for that sin. And the truth is, if you will accept Christ into your life today as Lord and Savior, he will pay the penalty for your sins right now. If you will open your heart, believe in him, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved and confess with your mouth and tell somebody, you know, I've asked Christ for my life. If you will do that, your sins can be paid for right now. Nail it down. If you've never prayed a prayer like that, if you've never opened your heart to God and you think you did or maybe you did at some meeting on some TV show or whatever, no, nail it down. If you're not sure, nail it down today. Nail down your spiritual freedom, your spiritual relationship with God here on July 5th. And it'll make the, all the difference for the rest of your life, actually, for the rest of eternity. So this is the truth. If you accept it and believe it, the truth will set you free. Now, I'm sure that many of you are thinking, well, Pastor, the, this is really too good to be true. The next question is, well, uh, why does not everyone um, accept the truth and to be freed from sin? Why, why don't people believe this? It's like it's too good to be true that Jesus died or, well, no, i got to work it out. And some say, oh, well, there's no God or, or you know, we evolved from monkeys and so there's no God. You know, people have all these sort of, uh, you know, excuses. And unfortunately, and this is our, our next point here, so why do people don't accept this? Unfortunately, our sin blinds us to the truth. Before we come to Christ, we are getting truth. We think what's true. Gosh, when you look at all the different media services and webs and TVs and all the different things, oh, is this truth or is that truth? And everybody's contradicting each other. This is the truth. This is God's word. This is foundational truth. And those of you who question God's word, that's a whole other problem, and that's your problem. But the whole point is this is true, and the, one of the reasons is you have sin in your life, and that's going to blind your eyes, that's going to shade your eyes from seeing the truth. Now look at John chapter 8, verses 33 through 37. It shows us how sin blinds our bondage. This is a great example of the people that Jesus had to deal with and how their sin blind, blinded them. Now look, look at verse 33. They answered him. And this is religious professionals. This is Pharisees. And they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me. <coughs> Excuse me, because my word has no <coughs> my word has no place in you. So when Jesus told the Pharisees, I like to call the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Scribes, they were, I call them religious professionals. It was prof their profession uh, to walk around looking spiritual, holier than thou, and just they thought they were special. And so we go on, and so they, he told them that they could be set free if they believed the truth, which was uh, that he was the truth. But they said, uh, catch this, that they were free. Hey, Jesus, we're free. I think you were mistaken. And we've never, not so ever, ever been enslaved to anyone. You're quite mistaken, Jesus. Now, come on. The religious professionals were blind to their current political situation and, and their history as a nation. Remember, Israel had been conquered twice and enslaved by the Assyrians and Babylonians. In, in fact, they were even... Uh, expelled from their land and, and, and taken to, uh, to those lands. And so they forget that they were in bondage. Remember when they were in Egypt? They were enslaved. So there's a, hey, we were never enslaved. Well, I'm sorry, yes, you were several times. And so now, what is interesting, Israel was now being occupied by the Roman, uh, Roman government. And they were under the Roman law, so they were right now being enslaved to another system, to the Roman law system. And so they were blind to their, their slavery. They were blind to the slavery they were, they were under in the past. They were not even talking about it. And even currently, there's Roman soldiers all around. Oh, I'm free to do what I want. No, you're not. So 
I know uh, exactly what many of you are thinking when I tell you that you were enslaved to sin. When I tell you that, that you're enslaved and, and the power of sin is uh, controlling your life and, and when you want to do good, it says, no. and even as a believer, you say, well, you know, I'm, I'm free and I'm not enslaved. Well, the truth is, if you're without Christ, you are chained to sin. Your old nature, which rebels against God and in its nature turns away from God, that that nature is going to want to continue to go away from God and also Satan, the evil one, is going to do everything he can to get false lies in front of your eyes and or that you might believe them and turn away from God. But this is very serious that uh, those who are blind need to understand that there are external forces which are trying to contribute to your spiritual blindness. They won't tell you the truth. They'll tell you the opposite of truth. And many times when they, they'll tell you just the bit of the truth, uh, they'll tell you some truth, but there's uh, just a little bit, but there's so much lie, it's hard to distinguish between what's true and what's a lie. So the truth is, bottom line, you're either serving God or you're serving the devil. Uh, there's no middle ground. Either you know Christ or you don't know Christ. And if you don't know Christ, I would implore you, I'd invite you, I'd ask you today to accept Christ. While this, the truth of God's word is coming to you today through the Holy Spirit as his word touches your heart, I would invite you to accept Christ and, and, and get rid of the blind, get rid of the spiritual blindness, get rid of the, the, the spiritual uh, apathy towards God. Well, moving on, not only does Jesus free us from sin, but we see that Jesus frees us from legalism. It frees us uh, anyway before we come to know Christ uh, as far as legalism and, and once we accept Christ's legalism. Now, let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, and we'll talk, uh, we'll go a little bit more into depth explaining what legalism is then and, and now. Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 and 6, Paul writes, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. In other words, he's saying you're free in Christ. Don't keep those chains on. Don't keep that, all those chains and, and neck yokes on that, that you're slave to sins. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will no longer be benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he's under obligation to keep the whole law. So if you've been severed from Christ, you are seeking to be justified by, by law, you shall have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. Now let's go look back a little bit and explain the historical context of what he's talking about here with the circumcision. Now in the Old Testament, God used circumstances, used circumcision, used the circumstance of circumcision, as an outward sign of what was supposed to show an inner relationship to God. Again, it was, it was an outward sign. It was something Israel did. In other words, to say, hey, I have a relationship with God and, and so I, I'm different. But unfortunately, this outward sign turned into a test of religious political correctiveness. In other words, the Jews turned circumcision into, well, if you're not circumcised, then you're not right with God. You know, there's another word, you, you, you're not a real Jew if you're not circumcised. And, that's, and that was because that's what the law said. But the, the problem is, again, God was more concerned about the heart. So in the New Testament, the New Testament Jewish Christians, after Jesus had come and uh, rose from the grave and then ascended to the Father. During that time, the, the New Testament, uh, the Jews that became Christians, uh, were wanting to add circumcision onto uh, what it meant to be saved. And this was going on, it was, I mean, this was going like wildfire. And Paul was one of the ones that had to actually confront Peter and say, hey, wait a minute, because Peter didn't want to eat with the Gentiles because they hadn't been circumcised. And so Paul just said, hey, Peter, what are you doing? Why aren't you eating with these folks? So again, he's being prejudiced. Uh, maybe a little racist. He thought he was superior to those who weren't circumcised. Yeah. And so here we go around again and it says, 
So it's a sign. It's an outward sign. And so they were trying to add that to Christianity. They're saying that Jesus on the cross plus circumcision equals salvation. Now think about this. And this is exactly what people do today to baptism. Many have tried to add baptism to salvation. Now, again, baptism is an outward symbol of what happens on the inside. Baptism explains the death is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And, of course, salvation is not measured out in buckets of water or how much but buckets, uh, whether you're sprinkled or, or sprayed or, 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 you know, dunked or whatever. That's not what's going to get you into heaven. Again, uh, salvation is not measured out in the buckets of water. Salvation comes through a relationship with Christ. So baptism is an external uh, showing, you know, this is what happened to me on the inside, and that's what baptism is. But unfortunately, people through the ages, what they've done in some uh, denominations or whatever, have actually made baptism a part of salvation. And that is what, you know, just put the word baptism everywhere circumcision is, and, and it makes it very clear it's an outward act. Now, so does baptism save you? Absolutely not. The truth is this, salvation equals the cross plus nothing. In other words, Jesus did everything on the cross for your salvation and my salvation and my baptism or circumcision or whatever else we want to add. That has nothing to it. So salvation equals the cross of Christ plus nothing. When you add the cross of Christ plus baptism, you got nothing. In other words, when you... Uh, try to add something to the saving blood death of Christ then you are trusting in something other than Christ to save you and you have nothing so if you have added if you're trusting in something else it's not going to get you there so let's move on again so Jesus is trying to tell the Galatians yeah, be free from legalism you know these things are okay but don't get caught up in them so today Jesus uh, as telling us that we need to be free from legalism. Now today, um, many people today would, would add these things. In other words, uh, today legalism would be, uh, in other words, you have to be baptized to get into heaven. In other words, if you die and you're not done before you die, you're going to hell. Well, I'm sorry, that's not, you know, uh, that's not biblical. They, again, it's, we are baptized to show what happened on the inside. Uh, there's other sort of things, well, well you've got to wear certain things, to, certain types of clothes to church. You know, if you don't wear this or that or, uh, you know, you've got to crease in or not crease in it, you got to tie, you got to cut. In other words, it, it, they're saying you're, you're more spiritual if you wear these things and you're less spiritual if you don't. Again, that's legalism. Uh, other things as far as legalism, you know, I give so much money and it's, it's because the money I give that's what's getting me into heaven. And again, uh, no, uh, that's, uh, that's legalism. How about church attendance? In other words, you know, I'm more spiritual than you because I attend a whole lot of church services. I'm there, well, back when churches were open, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Or maybe you're even doing it on, uh, online. Man, I hit every church, I hit every church service on Sunday, and I, I go through this one, and I hit uh, Max Licato and Tony Evans, and, you know, I hit all, all the greats. And uh, then, I, then I do everything every week, and I hit them over and over. And, and now maybe I'm a little bit more spiritual. Now, I'm not saying that's not a good thing to do to, to, to listen to these guys and myself. But the point is that's, you know, that's not going to get you into heaven. Uh, maybe it's, uh, you think of maybe if I read so many pages a day, I read so many Bible uh, pages a day, then, then I'm more spiritual, and, and that's going to get me into heaven. Or, or how many hours a day I pray. You get on your knees, and you're, you're just you know, babbling stuff and, and, and reading Scripture. And you just think, man, God's going to love me now. Well, no, that's not the basis of his love. His love is the basis of his love, and he proved it by the cross of Christ. And the other thing that some people do legalistically is, man, uh, I'm more spiritual, and, and, and I've, you've got to share and, and, and have, uh, have an opportunity to share Christ and have so many people accept Christ. In other words, if you're, if you're not seeing people come to Christ through your ministry, then, then, then you're not a Christian. Of course, we know Paul talks about you know, planting the seed and watering and, and some are reaping. So some of, we, some of us will never necessarily see, though, the results of the seeds that we sow. Again, this, the whole point is all these things that we talked about, these legalistic elements, these legalistic items are all good, but the problem is 
they will not add to salvation. Now, these things are good in and of themselves. Yes, baptism is great. Be baptized if you accept Christ. Yes, uh, look, you know, be decent when you go to church. Um, where you know, give, it's great to give, we're supposed to give at least a tenth of our income. Uh, <clears throat> yes, we are to attend church. Uh, the Bible tells us we're to meet together and, and fan the flame of, of the spiritual relationship we have with him with others. It's important that we read the Bible every day. It's important that we pray every hour a day. It's important, uh, not every day, well, we cease without praying, that we pray every day. And also it's important we share Christ with others. Now, all these things are good things, and I encourage you to do those things. But the Bible says we do these things because of, as a result of what Christ has done for us, not in order to get salvation. Again, that's very important. We do as a result of, not in order to get so it's very sad. Legalism takes good things and takes them out of context and then it traps us in a performance type of relationship rather than a relationship of grace and love. Well, God will love me more if I go over here and do this. No. You know, I want to do this because God loves me and what he did for me. So the question is, are you a slave to legalism? Uh, what actions do you think you perform in order to make God love you and accept you more? Uh, and this is even more important. What expectations do you put on others in their relationship or service to God? Uh, do you look down on people who don't do the things that you do? Uh, do you look down on because you do more? Or maybe you don't do things that they do. And so, again, there's that legalism. There's that spiritual superiority complex, which is just totally has nothing to do with God. So, now that we see that Jesus has given us this great freedom, that leads us to our next point. So what do we do with our freedom? Now that we're free, the next point we see here very truly is Jesus frees us to serve. Look at Galatians 5, verse 13. Paul writes, For you were called to freedom, freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So after addressing the fact that Christians were free from religious legalism, uh, Paul goes on to tell them that don't use your freedom to indulge in those old desires. Uh, they were to use their freedom to help others. So don't just, yeah, I'm free, I can do whatever I want. Because, you know, Christ paid. No, you don't go out and sin because you're free from sin and your sin has been paid for. Because you don't do that because of what it costs Christ and you know it hurts God's heart and you don't want to do that. And so we are not to use our freedom in that sense to go after what we want. But we're to use it, in other words, to set, uh, help and others. Peter puts it this way in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Now, Paul explains this in his church, in his concept to his letters to church at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 through 31. And, and so this is, this is what's going on. And we'll spend more time in this verse later because I think it applies to a lot of things currently in our uh, modern culture today. But in Corinth, what was going on, there were uh, a lot of old cults that worshipped all these different, uh, uh, you know, Greek deities or Roman deities. And so oftentimes there would be orgies and all sorts of wild behavior. And during this time, during the, the worship of these gods, uh, they would sacrifice an animal and cut the meat up and they would eat the meat. So eating meat would be associated to immoral uh, behavior, uh, unethical and moral behavior. And so when that person comes out of that, that situation, out of that organization and becomes a Christian, and so now they're out living their life, and so now they go over to somebody's house and say, hey, we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna have some, uh, some brisket tonight. Where, you know, I've been smoking it all day. I got the uh, pecan wood, or maybe you like to use hickory or apple. It doesn't matter, but anyway, they, they smoke that brisket all day, and, and uh, you know, the person sits down, and the first thing they're gonna ask you is, was this thing sacrificed to an idol? You know, is, is this because they need to know because when they think of that meat sacrificed 
to that idol, they're thinking, oh no, and then it gets them thinking and emotionally tying them, psychologically tying them back into that experience uh, with that old cult. So it, it was sin for them to eat that meat. And so uh, those in Christ, in other words, we know that there, is, there are no other gods. And so when we know we have the freedom. We can eat that brisket. We can eat that steak or that chicken or that, uh, you know, Boston uh, pot roast or whatever it is. It doesn't matter because those things, you know, it, when you ha know the truth that those guys don't exist, hey, man, it's a great, you know, USDA grade A choice meat and you're going to eat it. But in my freedom... I'm not going to offend the person over here who ties in the eating of the meat with that old religion. So I'm not going to uh, put myself first. I'm going to serve my brother or sister in Christ and say, make sure that when I serve that meat, I make sure that that meat, if I know they're there, make sure that it wasn't sacrificed to an idol. And so for them, I say, well, no, it wasn't. And I checked it and, and made sure it was. So even though I know it doesn't make any difference, and of course you tell them the truth, whether the meat was or was not from an idol, say, well, I don't know. Well, then maybe they shouldn't need it. The point is, their need is greater than my need. The truth and freedom frees me up to put others free. Let me say that again. The truth is, my freedom frees me up to put others first rather than my own selfish desires to have whatever stake that might be. Then last of all, we see spiritual freedom gives eternal life. When we accept Christ and receive that uh, spiritual freedom, it gives us eternal life. Let me read Romans chapter 6, verses 20 through 23. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard of righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin of death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The simple truth is this, our spiritual freedom gives us, through Christ, eternal life. Remember we talked about before, on this, not only does it give us the power of sin now, but the great news, spiritual freedom is, I'm going to spend eternity with God forever. And what a great place that's going to be. So if you'll accept Christ, then when you die, you can know without a shadow of a doubt that you will spend eternity in heaven. Wow, that's great. Well, let's close uh, with a couple of questions. Uh, again, very pointed, very, uh, again, very point blank. Uh, something that I need to deal with and something you need to deal with. Very, very first question is this. Each of us need to ask ourselves, am I a slave to sin? Oh boy, I can already hear you rattling off. I'm a slave, I'm free, I don't sin, I'm a, I'm a good man and a good woman, good boy, good girl. And, and you know, you, you think, you know, a lot of people think, well, if my good works outweigh my bad works. No, I, that doesn't work because then you never know. Uh, you know, if, if Christianity was about doing good and getting to heaven was about how good I could be, I would have I never been a part of it because I know there's no way I could live a perfect life or even a decent life uh, <clears throat> just because I know, you know, uh, you know, I worry, I get anxious and all the other things. <clears throat> and so we have to come to the realization that we have sinned, that we have fallen short, we've missed the mark. And as a result of that, am I a slave? In other words, uh, are, you, are you slave to, to shopping? Are you, are you slave to gossip? Are you uh, enslaved to uh, pornography? Are you, are you slave, any, you know, food source? Uh, you know, <clears throat> any sort of, you know, chocolate ice cream with whipped cream? Or it goes on, are you slave to a certain philosophy? You know, the first question is, am I a slave to sin? And that, again, could be someone, if I'm talking to someone who, who doesn't know Christ, 
and then you are you're enslaved to something to some other system but even as a believer as I talk to you you know even though you are a Christian you have allowed the the lies of the devil and of the world to come in and and the things you're doing uh, are pulling you away from God and, and you're a slave to it again the, all those things I mentioned there about you know pornography and stealing and gossip and and lying and all these other things this uh, uh, spiritual, you know, we, we fall into the uh, the bondage of thinking we're, you know, spiritually superior or racially superior than others. That's this. That's this false. That's that's a lie. So we have to deal with it and until again, like an alcoholic or a drug addict, until you're willing to admit that you're a slave, that you're enslaved to something, and that you are a sinner, someone who commits sin and is by nature someone who opposes God. You, you're not going to get better. But when the Holy Spirit touches your heart and you're willing to confess it, that you are a sinner and that you need Christ, that's the first place and that's when you need to uh, receive Christ in your life. Second question I want to ask you is, am I in bondage to legalism? Again, this question can go both to those who don't know Christ and those who do know Christ. Uh, let me talk to those who, who do know Christ. And it's so easy to slip into because that's what the world system is. We, we, we think that God loves us uh, because of our behavior, the things we do. And I mentioned all those religious things. Again, those are good things in and of themselves, but they're not the things that you gotta do to, in order to, ma to make God love you even more. So the question is, are you in bond, bondage to legalism? Are you a religious professional? Do you put all these different elements and checklists on, on the things that you do? Do you, do you think that's going to make God love you more? Uh, all those things, uh, those religious things that were listed there. Uh, do you do those things and think you're, uh, God's loving you more? And as a result, do you think you're just a little bit more uh, spiritual than everybody else? You know, you, you, and that's one of the things about the Pharisees, and that's where they got their self-worth was, and they walked out with their tassels and all their regalia, and they had the little Bibles rolled up, you know, phylacteries, I think it was, and, you know, <clears throat> they were just better, you know, oh, those sinners, don't get near me. I don't want to get near a Samaritan. I'm going to go all the way around. You know, they, they were in bondage to legalism, and I see so many people today uh, <clears throat> inflicting others with their legalistic attitudes and ideas about you got to do this or you got to do this so many times in church and so many times not in church, and well, heck, you're going to hell. You haven't been to church in a year. You know, all this kind of attitude, legalism, and it's directly against the cross of Christ. The last question I want to ask you this. Uh, very simply, specifically uh, for those who, who don't know Jesus Christ, is that uh, will you accept what Christ has done for you on the cross so that you might live free today? Again, what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, it's truth. He, you know, the, the payment has been made for your sin. It's a signed document, signed in his blood, a certificate of debt. It has been paid for. But unless you recognize it and use it, and I'll use the bank word, reconcile with God because of the payment of Christ, when you do that, then you will be free. You know, have you allowed... Christ to pay the penalty. So again, basically, we all have two choices. Again, uh, you know, those uh, who accept Christ will spend eternity with Him, and those who don't will spend eternity separated from Him. So uh, the the question is, uh, are you willing to bet your eternity on whether or not to accept Christ or not? Some of you say, oh, I'm not going to mess with that. Well, I guess we'll just see what you're going to do with that. So uh, if you don't know Christ, I encourage you to go back again and and take what has already been done for you and the salvation which was paid for you, your freedom which was paid for you, your eternal life which was paid for you, take that and experientially accept it and then live your life as a result, just like the Emancipation a Proclamation in Juneteenth. And if you'll do some uh, reading in history, it's interesting. This has happened all over in all, all parts of the world as far as freeing the slaves and how many 
uh, cultures and countries uh, would not free the slaves. They kept on, uh, you know, uh, enslaving them and, and trying to keep them in poverty so, so they would do their cheap work. And so the point is here, the same thing. Jesus died on, your cro on the cross for you so you could be free and that you wouldn't have to walk around with chains from the devil being, uh, being linked to, uh, empowered only to do those things which, which are, are dangerous, those things which will, will hurt you. And so if you will, again, take what, what has been done Again, what those slaves did on, on Juneteenth, in other words, they were told they were free. So they had a choice. They could either continue working as a slave or they could say, I am free and move on on. But then again, if you know history, it took a long time. In fact, you know, we're still dealing with the whole point of, uh, you know, that, you know, God loves everyone. And that the ground is flat at the cross. That no one should be enslaved. And so the same way, when we come to the cross, we need to understand that, hey, I've been freed. I don't have to live under the penalty of sin. I don't have to be hooked or in bondage to that sin because it's been paid for. Again, it goes down to knowledge and then taking that knowledge and experientially start living it out. So if you don't know Christ today, would you take to yourself, would you receive into yourself, would you... Uh, take what Christ did for you and say, yes, I want that payment. In other words, uh, you want Christ to pay for your sin rather than you having to pay for your sin and spending eternity separated uh, from uh, God forever. So here we are, another 4th of July, 2020. And so, yes, we're free from British tyranny and, uh, you know, all that was done there and, and through the years all the wars have been fought. But probably the most important lasting freedom that we need to come to grips with is our spiritual freedom of whether we're free to God or, or, or we're enslaved to the devil. And so, you know, this world's going to pass. We're not going to be here very long. And so, yes, we need to make sure uh, people are free and there is uh, justice and all of that. But the point is, more importantly, we need to individually take that freedom and then we need to share with others that they are free. Man, isn't that good news for 4th of July with all the stuff that's going on, pandemic and, and all and the such? You can be free in Christ now and forever. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the freedom of our country and how it has been uh, paid for by the blood of men and women throughout the, this, uh, throughout the ages. Lord, and very obviously this is not a perfect country. Uh, we do have, uh, on the positive side, we do have ideals of what we want it to be. And have tried to put laws in it to protect people. But unfortunately, uh, Lord, we know that people uh, just will not uh, treat each other fairly and, and with uh, justice and equality. But Lord, we know all that starts back with our individual freedom uh, as far as what we do with our freedom to either accept or reject Christ. And Jesus, thank you that you died on the cross uh, for your shed blood and your broken body. You you paid for our sins. You paid for it. And, and so now it's up to us whether to accept or reject what you've done on the cross. Lord, forgive us. Forgive me when we become legalistic in our relationship with you or when we become legalistic and, and put those things on other people. Lord, forgive us for that and help us just come back again to a faith-based, grace-based love relationship with you. Because you demonstrated your love for us by sending your son Jesus to die on the cross. And Jesus, you sac as you sacrificed your love, you showed your love for us. So may we show our love to you by accepting what you've done for us and then loving others. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.